All right, guys, our guest today was the original drummer and a founding member of Scritti Politi, the 80s band who were pioneers of DIY music before appearing successfully on the dance scene. Through his musical career, he has recorded with the likes of David Bowie, Madness, and many more. Fascinated by the creative process, he is passionate about sharing what he's learned about art, rhythm, and harmony over the past 65 years. From playing kit drums with Scritti Politi in his 20s, songwriting in his 30s, to studying psychology and uh, facilitation in his 40s. He went on to found Instant Teamwork, the company where he aims to deliver sustainable team bonding and building through a unique combination of humor, music, and harmony, synthesized from his years of diverse experiences. He believes that people can achieve great things when they, are over, when they overcome their natural fears and has empowered thousands of individuals to leave their comfort zones and ignite their creative curiosities. So with that, I'd love to uh, welcome onto the show, Mr. Tom Morley. Thanks for joining us today, Tom. Yeah, welcome. And uh, Tom, it's great to meet you. And uh, Les has given us some cliff notes, you know, about the different things you've done at different decades of your life. But what we'd love to do is to invite you to tell us your origin story, you know, how you've come to be the Tom of today, as far back as you'd like to go, as much detail as you'd like to give. We'd love to hear um, all about you and where you've come from. And the floor is yours. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in having heard that because I read that. Um, sorry, I wrote that intro some time ago. Uh, and well done for bringing those bits together. But I see you end in my 40s and I'm 66 now. So I'm wondering about those last 25 years. <laughs> 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 it's this kind of, yeah, I wonder what he did then. I'm trying to think back myself because that listening to you list it there, it, it's almost a kind of logical uh, progression. And I must have written it as such when I wrote that, but it doesn't seem logical now. And uh, or the the progression of people's lives doesn't seem logical now. And I think the last year of COVID and the pandemic has kind of shaken everybody in a way that, I mean, it's been global. So it it's a way we needed to be shaken. And I'm aware that we have an opportunity now to be uh, setting up, excuse me, a new normal. We don't have to go back to that linear, I did this and I did this and I did this and I did this anymore, which is a thing that we expect from school because we go through school like that. We're in the first year, we're in the second year, we're in the third year. You know, we, we go when I'm in the fourth year and then the fourth year does actually arrive. Whereas now, sorry, I'm thinking aloud here, but uh, but now <laughs> we could have thought, yeah, in my 20s, I'll do this, 30s, I'll do that, da, da, da. And then when it comes to 2021, I'll do this and 2022. But that's all up in the air now for everybody. So, um, yeah, I could give you a linear account, but actually it might be better if I just start a year ago when it all got shook up for me because yeah i'd built instant teamwork um I, you know i've got 300 drums like this in various stores around satellite and outhouse um and i go around the country getting or a year ago i used to go around the country getting teams to play drums together get them in the groove on the beat in singing in harmony achieving the impossible as far as they were concerned in an hour so that was a great life because they all thought it wouldn't work. <laughs> the, the person who booked me was always anxious. You know, well, I wonder whether we should have just got an Olympic rower or something, you know, someone who, who's <laughs> definitely got a medal in their pocket and can show it at the end, you know. People can fondle it in the bar later. You know, that's a much safer bet than getting a uh, kind of founder of a DIY group um, you know, who used to live in a squat, you know, all, the, all this stuff. Why would you, why would you get that guy? So, um, so it, it was a kind of dodgy enough proposition in, in the first place, but I always knew I could do it because I know pe people have a heartbeat. They're always going to come into sync. They actually want to come in sync, but many things in our society, um, 
or they don't conspire to divide us but it's easier to sell us stuff if we're all alone you know we need 20 if we're 20 people we need 20 washing machines if we lived in a kind of more intelligent society would share our washing machines, you know, so 20 people, 10 washing machines, but it, it doesn't really serve the economy. So we've grown up in this, you have to be individual and the, the individual has been glorified as the peak of our, you know, kind of achievement, our personal achievement in this life, but it's not, you know, living in community is, is a much better, way to live so that so how i used to do it was bring people together um playing drums or singing in harmony or or doing both you know half the group would it might be 100 people 100 people would be drumming half people would be singing you know we get mic'd up properly these amazing occurrences so when covid arrived and i had to go online all, all my tools were taken away from me so we couldn't be in sync anymore. That was one of the kind of USPs I could get. CEOs used to come up to me in a warm up just when we were just all playing one beat. They go, This is amazing. I've never heard them do anything like this before. I go, It's just a warm up, mate. We're going to play two <laughs> African interlocking rhythms in a minute. And then, so, uh, so I had all that and it was taken away. We couldn't sing in harmony because everyone's sound is rubbish. And we're out of time anyway because of the latency issue. So we can do that. And the one thing about people um, having permission in their heads to do this sort of unusual out of comfort zone stuff was they were away at some far flung conference center. The blinds were down, the cameras were off. Nobody was ever going to see it. It was never going to be on YouTube. Their, their kids were gonna, not going to know. You know, nobody was going to know. And here they are. They're doing it at home. Even the dog's watching. So, and, and the neighbors are looking through the window going, what's he doing in there? So, so all my tools were taken. However, I found that if I played music on this system through, you know, through to their homes, individually they wouldn't hear any but what anybody else was doing they'd see it on the screen in grids of 30 or 60 or you know whoever was on the zoom call um and they'd see people dancing out of time with them to the same piece of music waving wooden spoons or something which you you'll see if you look me up there's lots of people waving wooden spoons um but we'd all be out of time at the same bpm so if i was playing a a song at 130 beats per minute you might have someone going like this someone else going like that um but that all be out of time together so it it's been an amazing year because i spent in its and team uh, talking about those 20 lost years or those 25 lost years i spent that time um getting people out of their comfort zones and saying yeah challenge yourself you know and suddenly I had to walk the talk and uh, uh, it was hard you know I spent two weeks resisting it and then I looked in the cupboard and there was no food there and I thought all right I gotta get over it and so um <laughs> that's that's the short story um so uh, I thought well I just gotta try it so I had to step way out of my comfort zone because like I say all my tools were taken away except I suppose People would say, I'm just, this is just coming to me now, talking to you. I, I always had a sense of humor about it. And people would say, we went, we went with it. We didn't think we'd all drum. We did, the last thing we thought we'd be doing is singing. But you just seem to be really light about it. And, you know, I've got quite humorous warm up. So we thought, well, let's give them a chance. So I think the same has happened online because especially with, the people who have booked me who have been anxious and most people are anxious about doing online events whether they admit it or not I've said look don't pretend this is going to be seamless I'm going to be pressing buttons I'm going to be swapping cameras I'm going to be you know and that there's some humor in that you know for people have always said ah oh, when you you know when when you strap your drum on on stage and then it fell off the strap broke we all thought that was great you know, it's like we couldn't tell whether you'd done it on purpose 
to sort of give us permission to make mistakes. So uh, I can tell you, I wasn't doing it on purpose, but you know, there's there's enough around what I do that people think, oh, this guy is right. He's right on the edge himself. All right, that kind of allows us to try it, and especially with a whole bunch of technology. Right at the beginning, um, I just used to have. There used to be a sofa right here in front of me, and I had a. a um, a small coffee table, then a recycling crate, and then one laptop um, that used to get so hot the fans had come on after about 10 minutes. So I had that on four ice packs out the freezer to try and keep it cool. And uh, I remember one time I was right in the middle of a performance and I was using Wi-Fi, foolishly. Um, it decided that my neighbor had a stronger signal than me. So it said, we're swapping you to your neighbor's Wi-Fi. So, so everything just went off. Um, when I came back on, they were still there. Luckily, I had a co-facilitator in another land, you know, said, we'll just fill the gap while Tom gets back. Uh, when I came back, Zoom at that time didn't remember any settings. So I had to do all my settings again. Everyone's going, it sounds really rubbish now. <laughs> so it's just... <laughs> so I had this catalog of disaster. I'm sure everybody's got these stories. Anybody who went online early, um, but we got, you know, we got through it because there was a sense of in that early, in those early days. It's like I'm talking about the war, but but it was a bit like that because we're all struggling with new conditions all the time. In those early days, um, just we were all saying does this work does that work does that work so there was this kind of camaraderie around it and everybody was forgiven and some i was saying to some friends of mine at morning gloryville we, we started up doing parties early um morning gloryville is a, a sober rave i don't know if you know about it. it's in, in the uk and it's, it's kind of global but it's based in london um we were saying we've got about three months of this when everyone's going to forgive us and then, we've, then everything's got to go right. So I built this studio. Um, we started getting cabled up. You know, we never used Wi-Fi anymore. But in those early days, I had people spotlighting for me and uh, I'd say, you, you okay with the spotlight? And they'd say, yeah, yeah, I'm getting off the phone now because I'm saving the charge in my phone. I'm going to spotlight from the phone and i can only afford so much network per week and i'm nearly out <laughs> so, <laughs> man talk about you know i mean it was oh, you you get a picture <laughs> everyone was just kind of going yeah i think i can just do it and and even recently uh one of my spotlighters i'd booked for for an event i said are you okay you're okay because she normally she contacts me early she said yeah um, I've got held up. I'm going to do it from the bus. So she spotlight in a corporate event, uh, sitting on the top deck of a bus, you know, hoping <laughs> the hoping the signal's going to last. Can you imagine? Anyway, sorry. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Tom, mate, quite a so, long answer. <laughs> no, no. I, look, Tom. I'll, I'll, what I'll say first is that's probably like the most unique um, answer. To that particular question that we've ever got on the show um <laughs> and and that's not in a not in a bad way at all and uh, i think mm. it sort of um you know tells a a little bit about who you are um in a sense you know i get that sense from you um mm. you know like you said when i was reading out your bio it is um obviously organized in a very linear way for a reason you know it, it makes sense yeah. for for to tell the story uh, so to speak in that way um, you know, to to attract the audience and 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 whatever, just basically tell a a, a catalog, so to speak, of the the achievements that you've um, you know mm. um, had in life. But um, but then you tell me about you know uh, your your response is really you know it's you're jumping from one thing to the other, and 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 it all makes sense to me, mate, in in a in a mm. funny way. In that, I guess that. Uh, it's sort of telling the story about who you are as a person, someone who's very adaptable. Um, and I think that perhaps uh, starting as a, a creative and as a musician um, and, a, and a DIY musician at that, you know, it, it sort of speaks to that mm. thing. So, so I'd love to like, you know, dive a little bit deeper more into, you know, um, 
those, those early days of founding uh, Scritti Politi and um, you know what was the motivation behind that and like I guess um, how do you feel that I guess that in, uh, creative energy and creative um, motivation arose from you as, a, as an individual? I think as a as a polymath and I only learned this word you know as, as an adult it, it wasn't um, wasn't even around you know the, the kind of renaissance person or multi-skill person the the only um term for it when i was at school was a jack of all trades master of none so it it was a derogatory term you know don't you know just stick to one thing but but at, as a polymath there, there is um there's an aspect of being a polymath that I, i've since learned that we get into something, we get to the essence of it, and then it's not that we get bored. We we say, um, "All right, I know that now." So I've learned about art. I've learned about sculpture. I've learned about you know painting. I've learned you know how to mix the colours, all that. But that in that, before we move on, I, I think I don't know if it's an aspect of everybody's polymathism, but it's certainly an aspect of mine. I think. If I had to teach this, how would I go about it? How would I? So when it came to Scritti Politi and making our own record, it be, it was sort of natural for us to say, uh, and we used to get people coming around to the house. There was no email in those days. They'd come and knock on the door and say, we want to make our record. Can you tell us how? So we, we put all the details on our first um ep skank block bologna uh on the record cover so here's the number of a press implant here's the uh number of a studio spacewood studios in cambridge i remember so we put those details and i think we put the prices on and we put our address can you imagine this right we put our address on the record sleeve <laughs> and said if you want to come around come and see it so we used to get we're re really, literally, we used to get people knocking on the door saying, we want to make our own record. And if we liked them, we'd make them a cup of tea. And if we really liked them, we'd uh, take them down the pub and just make an evening of it. And, uh, and we made some good friends that way. So um, I'm trying to remember your question. It's uh, it's diving deeper into... so that, that uh, And how we got into making records... We met at art school, Green and I, and, and his mate from Wales, Neil, came to stay in Leeds with us. We met there and we were going to, we were all going to be artists, you know, or Green and I were going to be artists or designers or, you know, and, and we went to Leeds because it was the freest um, course in the country. So you could, it was like now they try and gear it to industry. They give you a foundation year where you, check all the different disciplines out and then you choose what your next three years is going to be pointing at a job there was none of that in those days they just said do what you want for four years and we got government grants we got our rent paid we got our food and drink paid you know so we didn't really know how lucky we were we just thought that's that's the way the world is and that's the way it's going to be it didn't turn out that way but we were very class conscious. We were quite political. We were quite left wing. So, um, in fact, our first incarnation of Scree Politi was we were called the Against, like the Clash. We we're trying to think of something like that. And we used to have a hammer and sickle as a, as the G in the Against. Uh, you don't see this on on the on the news, but so that that was a, it. it it was quite a short period we were the against. We soon became Scritti Politi after Green read uh, Antonio Gramsci's book, uh, Scritti Politici, which he wrote in jail, allegedly, and smuggled out through the bars. It was all very romantic. And right. um, that book, Scritti Politici, was all about hegemony and how you can control the people without guns if you control the common sense. So if the common sense is, you know, an honest day's pay for an honest day's work, don't buy the hand that feeds you, then you just, um, you don't, 
you don't start a revolution. You just think, no, a revolution doesn't make sense. It's because that's not in your head. So we we thought about that and we thought, well, who are we making art for? We're making, sorry to use this language, it's a bit old fashioned, but we're making art for the bourgeoisie to boost their kind of spiritual credibility and to keep yeah. them in a position of power, spiritual power, you know, intellectual power. You can't touch us, we know more than you, sort of thing. Yeah. And um, so we thought, well, that's not right, is it? We can't be, uh, we can't be revolutionaries um, and be boosting the bourgeoisie. So we said, let's form a band. I was quite good at rhythm. I could get people dancing at parties. I'd found this as a teenager. Uh, if I started dancing, everybody started dancing, which was weird because I was a really shy child. So, so rhythm was my salvation, really as a young man interested in meeting young women. So I knew that worked. Green could already play the guitar. And so we said, well, let's just write some songs to deliver the messages we want to deliver. Because as an artist, you can, uh, you know, even Guernica, you, you, you know, you can you get something in there, but you have to have someone to explain it to you. And most artists aren't that literal anyway. Um, so they just do their work and hope it's going to have some good effect. If you write a song called White Riot or, you know, it, it's it's fairly clear what you're on about. So we thought, let's be direct. And, and that has been, that's kind of what I've been doing ever since. You know, the, the whole thing about turning up uh, to a conference center with 100 drums and saying, we're going to get you out of your comfort zone. You're going to play together. You're going to learn something from listening to each other because we're going to split you. Half the group's going to be playing this rhythm, half that rhythm. You're going to learn. You've got to listen to the others while concentrating on your own part. You know, for some, they've never ever done that in their life. So it's, and it's a kind of wham, bam. I'm here for an hour. And sometimes I say to people, if they look a bit reluctant in a warm up, I say, look, your boss. It's paying me a lot of money to be here. So you can either join in and fully get involved or basically you can piss it up the wall. I, I don't use that language. <laughs> and so they get into it pretty quickly and they do get those benefits. You know, it, it's transformational work, but there's no, you know, we're going to do a three month uh, lead in where you can do these exercises. Yeah, forget it. You know, we're just going straight in. And that, that's what Scritty Politely were always about. We played our first gig only having three songs. And everyone was going, yeah, more, more. <laughs> we, we haven't got any more songs. <laughs> so I think we played the, the first one again. But that, that's about, um, that's what we like. And I, I love approaching life in that way uh, like i say i'm naturally an introvert i was a very shy child but i've trained myself to just jump in jump in it's like getting into a swimming pool you can ease yourself in rear if it's cold ease yourself in you know an inch at a time go oh uh, uh, i mean you just jump in and you go god it's great actually so that's what i've been doing for the last uh 25 those last 25 years i've been saying the groups come on let's jump in you know follow me <laughs> and then we make some brilliant noise again that's i've awesome. forgotten the question but no that's all right i think there was i think there was some of the answer in there there's some of the depth you know and some of the detail no there definitely was and i'm also really interested tom you know you just mentioned it at the end there while you were speaking about what you were that uh you know you're an introverted shy person but um you also said you're very direct and that you just trained yourself to keep jumping yeah. in. How did that come about from you? And was there like a transition or a period there that you can see that really you moved from being that introverted person that might've been a bit shy, too shy or scared to being someone who just wanted to jump in? Yeah. I think as a teenager, I thought I'm never going to have sex with any girls uh, if I stay this shy, you know, so let me, try and do it the way the extroverts do it oh that worked um <laughs> so uh so, so there was no turning back you know <laughs> i won't Strong go into motivation. the details <laughs> but um but it my my brother um bob was uh my 
three years older than me he was into i mean this was in the 60s so he was into Jimi hendrix and uh pink floyd and stuff and in those days the way we there was no facebook so the way we used to signal our interest was we used to walk around at school with record record covers under our arms as if we were gonna go and play them in the common room or something but it was a way of uh saying this is my personal taste and i had um I had curly hair, so I had this kind of afro, I had Jimi Hendrix under my arm, and one of the best looking girls in the school was a big Jimi Hendrix fan, so it wasn't that difficult. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and, and then we became this sort of golden couple, you know, I thought, this is much better than being shy. You know? uh, and so, they, it, it wasn't like therapy. Oh, I wish I could be like that. I suddenly was like that and getting getting all sorts of benefits. So it, it wasn't difficult, which is why I say to people um, in this world, you know, you might as well just jump in. We're going to keep doing it anyway. I'm booked, you know, uh, so you can either have an uncomfortable hour or have a, have a great hour, you know, something might happen. So, so my, one of my meditation teachers said, don't, um, don't try and, you know, pe people say, people, it's so mad. People think meditation is clearing the mind, you know, stopping the mind from chattering. It, that's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. Mind just too strong. But he, he always said, just give it something more charm you know that the mind goes to areas of charm it wants to be charmed so give it something more charming to concentrate on which is why people do create a visualization or they look at the candle or they you know they just concentrate on their breathing which if you concentrate on your breathing is actually quite beautiful compared to you should never have done that you should now oh, why did you do it <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of mm. monkey mind going on all the time so um this has a great point, this story, but I've forgotten the question again. It's, uh, where am I going? Oh, so it's about being shy. Yeah, so so the whole thing of, like I say, walking down the, the corridor with my beautiful girlfriend, you know, being invited to all the parties that ever happened so we could get people dancing. Um, it wasn't like, oh, you know, I've got to do that for another day. <laughs> It was like, I like it. I like this. It was like being let out of jail because, you know, I wasn't born shy. I learned to be shy because I had three older brothers who kept telling me, I mean, I love them to death, but they kept telling me I was doing everything wrong all the time. So I gradually shrank. But, oh, and there's one thing you said about being direct. What you learn as an introvert, because you're looking all the time, you're not, you're not turned off. You're looking, looking. Oh, that's how that. That's how that's done. That's how that. And that's how I negotiate that. So when you actually do have to speak, or people invite you to speak, oh, what do you think about it, Tom? You just go, well, obviously, I think we should be doing it in this way, but I think you should put that first, and uh, and we could do it in half the time if we started at this time. I go, blimey, you know. So shy people, they're they're not. They're not dull. Um, they spend their time working stuff out. There, there's, I'll tell you what, one thing um, I learned from a book called the, the Highly Sensitive Person is that if you believe we in evolution and we've, we've evolved from monkeys, there's uh, monkeys do something in the jungle. When they're foraging for food, 90% of them will, yeah, they'll, they'll be checking, check, ah, here's a tree, you know, it's ripe, fruit. That, so they're up it. They're eating about five percent of those monkeys don't do that they um they're the guards they're, they're looking out for predators and if they see anybody coming they'll set up the alarm now they get fed by the other 95 percent who value them but they're just built a different way so there's this theory that five percent of us are tuned to the world in that way so we become the healers you know the kind of um well, the artist, basically, because we're looking at, uh, we're, like I say, as um, as a polymath, we look out and we go, ah, oh, okay, I see what's wrong over there. I could go and fix that. I could go and fix that. I could go and fix that with a song. You know, I mean, fix it with a song. Sounds a bit romantic, but we do kind of look 
this is what that and, and it's why we get into politics of course because we think why are those people doing it that way it's so short term if you look at the long term mm. benefits we should just do it this way you know trump's a great example of that trump was just kind of trying to get to the end of the week whereas um biden seems to have a longer term policy not not that i'm political in any way anymore anybody who's listening who's going to employ me <laughs> I, i'm completely bipartisan <laughs> uh, it's um it's really interesting tom i love the the way that you uh explore things and link things when you're discussing them it, it's super interesting and like les was mentioning earlier it gives us a bit of an insight into who you are and, and how you traverse the world and it's beautiful and um you know i think it's uh one of those things that can spur people to be more exploratory in their own lives mm. um you know a lot of the things you're talking about are things that we think about but in different ways um just as humans and you mentioned earlier that we all want to be in sync. And I'm also really curious to, to figure out from you how you worked that out. Because when you mentioned that, it makes sense, you know, from some of the things you've been talking about and you could go to parties and get everybody to dance. If you just started to dance, they're all getting in mm. sync with you. Um, mm. I'm really interested to, for you to, I guess, elaborate on that and how you work that out. It's a kind of collective sense of flow. So, flow is found at the intersection of discipline and surrender so you need the discipline to get yourself there and uh get dressed and be invited in the first place and then flow comes when you give up you know if we're talking about dancing at a party flow comes when you get on the dance floor you're a little bit kind of tense at first but then you just kind of get into the groove now it's much easier to do that with a group of people who are also doing it um, and there'll always be people at different stages on the dance floor some will have just joined some some will have been there right from the beginning but you can enter this state of flow easier with other people because they keep it going it, it's like a sort of relay of uh, discipline and surrender mm. um, so it interests me to set that up with people without, like I say, without having to talk about it, without having to convince them. I just say, we've only got an hour, let's get started. And then all the theory I can deliver, but actually it's uh, it's something I'm starting to do more of. I'm starting to speak about it on stages. I didn't used to speak about it at all. Um, and there's been, it, if you read about flow, it's higher than the pursuit of happiness. I mean, it, everybody says this. You know, you know, you can be doing anything. You can be surfing. You can be playing tennis. You can be gardening. Even it could be something you know quite passive. Well, not passive, but not you know not requiring total go for it uh, mm. energy. When you're in that state of flow, you don't care how much money you got. You don't care whether the house is painted. Who you know? Who cares? Because, uh, and, and I always think this, uh, in the American Constitution, they talk about the pursuit of happiness as if it's the highest thing, that they should really just cross that out. You know, if, if I had a, a quill, I would go and just cross that out in the museum, <laughs> wherever it's displayed, and put flow. We should all just have the pursuit of flow. Sorry if there's any um, serious people listening, but I wouldn't really do that. <laughs> To the american constitution <laughs> but it's a it's a kind of advanced state and i, I think I'd, i've got a feeling i've no science you won't read about this in the lancet but i got a feeling that we used to be in the state of flow much more often when we were cave people we'd need to be if we were fighting a, a you know trying to track down a mammoth and kill it so we could feed the tribe um, we wouldn't be able to go, oh, I don't really feel like mammoth hunting today. Can we, uh, can we just do Deliveroo? You know, it did, didn't exist. So you'd have to be working together. You'd all have to be in a heightened state. And, um, and so it's kind of more natural. As, it, as we, you know, the kind of post-industrial uh, revolution, once we could just start to buy goods, uh, you know, I'll just get it on my phone. I won't even get out of bed. I'll just get it delivered. You know, there was, 
there's fewer experiences of flow around. So now we have to go for them. We have to set up workshops. We have to read books. We have to be tricked, you know, by people like me. My wife says never use the word trick. People don't like to be tricked. But I do, I do trick groups into, into flow, you know, like I say, with humor, with just kind of ease, with, well, let's give it a go anyway. You know, nobody's watching. Um, so, and then they have that experience and like, like I say, your question is about what, why I do remember the question about why, why I like doing this in groups or why, um, and that's it. It's, it happens fast within groups. And if, and, and the thing is without fail, whatever trip I've had, whatever trouble with the, you know, it, it, I could have all sorts of trouble going to gigs and setting up and arguing with the hotel people about where to put the drum down, all that. About three minutes before any gig, I forget this is going to happen. Bang. I'm in flow. It just kind of hits me. And I, um, okay. I, and this thing of ch message in my head goes, it's not about you anymore. It's about them. Like I say, I forget it's going to happen every time. I'm surprised I remember this time, but it's been happening for 20 years. It's not about you. It's about them. And then, so when I'm kind of facing an audience, be it 20 people or, or a thousand people, um, what they see is me coming up in flow. And uh, I think they get something from that straight away, you know, cause I am at that. I, I don't call it, uh, flow. I'll call it the groove. I say the groove is found at the crossroads of discipline and surrender because it's more visual mm. to imagine yourself at the crossroads. And, uh, and that's where I try and live. Even if I'm just shopping in Tesco's, you won't see me just pushing a trolley in. You know, here we go. I'll, I'll be holding it. I'll be experimenting with holding it on the side with one hand and seeing if I can turn it before this family, uh, you know, and I'll do it to entertain the children. So I'm just walking on and it turns around and I just grab it again, carry on it. Wow. Do you see what that guy did? You know, so that we, we have to keep it going in that way. You can't just go, I will get into flow when I'm at the conference. <laughs> <laughs> you get, and you could, yeah, I mean, you do anything as a drummer. I tell people, if you want to be a drummer, yeah, practice with the sticks, but during the day, open doors with the weak hand, clean your teeth with the weak hand, you know, train the, the weaker uh, limb to be as strong and as coordinated as the, as the, you know, most people are right-handed. So train the left hand to be the right, do what the right hand can do. And again, it's, it's all just gets you into a state of flow because you're kind of pushing your edge all the time. So you're at that. I mean, if there's anything that people take away from this, you know, be at the crossroads of discipline and surrender and find out what that means to you. Yeah. And it's a beautiful way to um, describe it, mate. I think it's a, it's a wonderful imagery. And, um, you know, I, I love the way that I guess you sort of paint the picture in terms of saying that um, it's something that is, uh, I guess, less common these days. And I, and I agree with you. And I think that a lot of that, what we've discussed to this point really points to that fact, you know, the, the fact that um, we sort of very much lean into what is comfortable these days, right? And when, yeah. when we're, I, I guess, comfortable, where we, there's, there's less intention behind, and I suppose that, that there is a level of intention required to, you know, uh, that, that sort of informs the, the uh, discipline uh, side of things. And um, we're lacking mm. that sort of um, intention in, in, in what we do. Uh, with with regards to getting into flow and um i suppose you know uh, the other thing is there's a lot more information out there and a lot more noise out there that sort of uh shrouds our ability to um, decide what what it is that we feel we need to do or how we need to you know quote unquote be um, and that's why some of these tools that you're talking about whether it be uh, drumming or just being mindful in everyday life or meditation, you know, gives us the opportunity to be intentional and, uh, you know, set those directions in where we want to point ourselves and uh, flow in that way. Uh, and like you said, it doesn't matter what it is that we do, uh, whether it's something super, you know, deemed as super important or you're just 
gardening um you know mm. there's this opportunity for us to to dive into a deeper experience of what is in front of us absolutely i mean we all would we all walk every day that there's a way of walking in flow and there's a way of walking unconsciously it it's a sad thing i don't, I don't know if this happens where you are but certainly in the uk there's there's a thing that happens to men uh probably i would say i mean it happens younger and younger i'll see if i demonstrate it i'll just put my coffee there <clears throat> as i learned this on the open university in, in order to uh that not in this way that i'm going to describe it but um in order to walk with any momentum we need a certain amount of height which is why when you see um, Groucho Marx doing his walk, he stays at the same height. So he's kind of going like this. Uh, I can't do it that well in the studio. But, um, so you think that's weird. Why, why is it looking weird? It's because actually when we walk, we need a bit of height, right? So I'm exaggerating there. And that gives us the forward momentum. Now, if you watch toddlers who have just learned to walk, they get that height by rocking from side to side because they're keeping their balance. As we mm. get older, we just go, I want to get there. So we're good at keeping our balance now. Um, but you see men over 30 in the UK, that weirdly enough, they start wearing shorts again. And then they, you see them coming out the pub, walking like this. That's not even, they don't, it's nothing to do with the alcohol. I shouldn't have said the pub. I see them walking by the river, looking, walking <laughs> like this, right? Oh yeah, yeah. No, I said I'll be there, so I'm going. And so they get their height uh, walking like toddlers again. Now, if you're conscious of that, I mean, it's a lazy way of walking. That, that If you're conscious of it and you think, oh, I'm James Bond, I've just got to go and get in my Aston Martin and save the world. Then if you walk from the hips, you know, if you do that toddler walk, oh, I'll go save the world. You know, it doesn't look that convincing. You're not going to get the job. But if you walk from the hip, so you think, I'm going to put this hip forward, now I'm going to put that hip forward, now I'm going to put So you might end up looking like Grace Jones or something. But it's, um, so you've got to find a, a good balance. But if you look at uh, good actors, that that's what they're doing. Runway models uh, exaggerate it. But the, you don't see people... Uh, you know, doing the latest Stella McCartney coming down the catwalk, going like this. <laughs> I'm an adult. Because that's basically what it's saying. I'm, I'm an adult. I know where I'm going. And I'm going to use the most efficient way to get there. And that's to use my hips for my propulsion. So there's ways of getting into flow. People wouldn't even know. They, they wouldn't go, oh, he's doing a flow exercise or she's doing a flow exercise. They're just saying, yeah, that, that person looks like they know what they're doing. And, and of course, just like smiling when you're not happy, if you use those muscles, those facial muscles, you will become happy because the chemicals of happiness will uh, be triggered by, by the facial muscles. So it's the same thing. If you use your hips when you, when you move forward, uh, mm. then you'll get, you'll get into flow. You won't go, oh, damn, I wish I was in flow. You'll just be there unless you're super anxious about something but even then it will um it will overcome the anxiety so. yeah i'm surprised it sounds like i know something i always think i'm an idiot but uh but i see uh, thank you for these questions <laughs> oh of course no thank you for your wisdom mate and i think it's uh look it's so interesting that you bring up this um this example of of walking as well because um you know on in the same vein like if you if you look at people who, and study people who walk in, you know, busy metropolis and, um, you know, busy cities and things like this. Um, you know, there's there's a very, um, you know, there's there's a lot of anxious energy that is held when yeah. they walk. You know, it's very fast. It's very strong. Um, you know, they're almost like leaning forward when they're walking. You know, they need yeah. to get to the next place. But then, if you compare that to, you know, say, um, our ancestors, the hunter gatherers, um, and how intentional they were about their walking, like they felt every stick and every stone that was under their foot, and it was like almost a, a, each step was like a, a, a subtle exploration of the land and things like this. Like, yeah. I think that's a beautiful, I guess, uh, contrast of what, um, I guess. Uh, modern times are reflective, uh, um, I guess, of that that anxious energy that we 
uh, consistently hold in the stress and all this sort of thing versus, you know, those really um, intentional actions moment by moment and um, which embody flow. Yeah. And, and we, yeah, we're tense or, or those, those crowds you're describing, they're tense, but they, they're dressed in a way. I know what I'm doing. You know, I've spent a lot of money on this outfit, but the, if you then go to Bali or Thailand or somewhere and you see um, people selling in markets and they're crouching down with their feet flat on the ground in a mm. low crouch, you know, with a pile of stuff in front of them, you think, they must do a lot of yoga. Uh, I, I've been doing yoga for five years and I managed to get my heels down. They just live the more natural, more kind of, um, uh, you know, what, what's the word? I don't want to sound too hippish, but it's, it's just more organic. It's more, they're just more, they're part of nature, basically. We've separated mm. ourselves from nature. And it, I, I remember watching um, nature programs where, They'd be talking about a lion going, you know, going after an antelope and, or lioness, and you say she's she's resting at the moment. She knows she's only got one more chase in her energy energetically, um, or she can't run again today. So she has to really kind of be sure she's going to get that antelope or weigh it up anyway. And I remember the first time I. I saw that I was quite young and I thought, well, why don't she just have another go later? You know, like, like we would. And, um, we don't honor our energy in that way. And we don't honor, uh, f you know, we just think I'll get another one. You know, we break something, especially now we just, Oh, it's broken. I'll get another one. I can get it on Amazon prime by tomorrow, which reminds me if I've, if I hear a knock on the door, I'm going to have to go because I'm, I've got a delivery for my wife. We're getting a 50 foot cables from here so she can do another uh, event tomorrow downstairs. So, uh, anyway, <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll leave it with a neighbor. Uh, luckily, we are quite a tight community here. But, um, but we just think, yeah, I'll just get whatever I want whenever I want. And that is just coming back to where we started from with the pandemic. It's a really strange thing. I always thought when they started talking about the consumer society on TV, on the news, we're living in a consumer, they talk about it as if it's so normal. And I think, it, you know you know what, if I was a, a leader, I wouldn't tell my people they're living in a consumer society. I'd keep it hidden from them because it sounds so kind of nasty in a way that you have to... You know, when um, I think when the first lockdown ended, the, the government here said, we know you like working from home, but will you please go back to your offices and do that three hour commute? Because we need to keep the cafes open in town and you're the consumers and this is a consumer society. But but the people said, well, we're not, do <laughs> we're not doing that. <laughs> um, and it, it's like a, a veil was lifted. We we have to consume in this consumer society. And and the thing is, the deal we made, and I, I include myself in this, the deal we made with the consumer society was, all right, we'll consume as long as we can have whatever we want, whenever we want. Deal? Okay, that's a deal. And then it, uh, in the pandemic, we couldn't get, whatever we want, whenever we want. I had to start washing clothes. I used to go down to, my wife will tell you this, so I used to go down to TK Maxx and just buy another shirt. I like shirts, by the way. Um, rather than, uh, I always think washing clothes ruins them, so I wash them at the very last minute. Uh, so, um, But I couldn't do that anymore. So, uh, And then people learn to cook. You know, Everyone's learned to cook during the pandemic because they're not buying from Pret and Wash and uh, uh, much as I like Pratt Manger, you know, and other outlets are available, that uh, we we had to become self sufficient. So it was like the veil was lifted, and people weren't going to gyms. So you'd see them jogging, or especially in the first wave here of lockdown, we live quite near a park, and people actually built their own gyms out of logs, and uh, you, you know. 
they didn't have membership and everything, but that they would collect these logs and stuff, and you'd see the same people out there every day doing 20 lifts of this particular log or uh, quite ingenious stuff. So we became in that DIY way, uh, which really interests me. Uh, you, you can probably hear some banging going on in the, in the background. There's some people next door doing some DIY. But, um, <laughs> it really interests me that uh, we do have these things. And I, I was helping, like I say, before I came on, I was helping to make brand his studio and he's got a lot of analog equipment in that studio and he built the studio himself in his own backyard and uh i was saying what you know he's saying what's my usp i said well look you you cannot get an app that kind of downloads a a yard it you know he specializes in in getting old synths and all sorts of stuff so it's all analog but so we're we're playing with that idea of his name's Bruno, Bruno's Yard, Bruno's Tune Yard, or get yourself tuned up at Bruno's Yard. So it's not like download this app. It will give you, you know, echo or whatever you want, reverb. Do you want to be in a cathedral? Do you want to be in a big room? Do you want to be in a small room? You know, so it, 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 we we live in the, in this in this consumer society where everything's every need is tried to be catered for by an app or a service or preferably a subscription that you forget about after three months and then <coughs> i'm gonna have on my gravestone i'm gonna have please um please cancel my subscriptions because i think i've got so many now and I, i've forgotten them but that that's me being a good consumer in the consumer society <laughs> do you know what i'm gonna do it after this podcast i'm gonna get online i'm gonna get, I'm, I'm subscribed to all sorts of things that i, I needed <laughs> once you know and they said you need this you know you need this legal service uh, yeah all right we can provide that just sign up for this free month you know but we need your credit card details uh, you know like the L. It's funny anyway you, you were talking about the consumer society i was talking to my partner about it last night funnily enough because uh -huh. um you know, uh, here in Australia as well, people have been working from home and uh, she's been going back into the office now for a few days a week um, from mm -hmm. not going into the office any days a week. And yeah. she was like, ah, oh, you know, I didn't realize how much I was spending on actually getting to and from work. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. And then what about the meals that you buy when you're there? And then yeah. what about the clothes that you have to buy that <laughs> you have to wear to that job? Because they're the clothes that you must wear. Yeah. And all these sorts of things. And, and um, you know, I was just reminiscing on that conversation while you were describing the consumerism and, and our consumer society, which is, you know, there's all this stuff built into making us buy things so that we can do this next thing, but then we've got to buy it to be able to do that. And then we're going to work so that we can get the money to buy the thing to be able to work. And it's just, yeah. where, does it, yeah. where does it start and where does it end? And then once you've got it, you've got to insure it. And then, uh, and then once you haven't got room for it in your house, you've got to rent some storage to put it in because you might need it again <laughs> when you move to a bigger house. So it's the, but the thing is, <coughs> and I think I'm very grateful to the pandemic for that on a on a long term scale, um, long term scale. That is that it's it's highlighted all of that. It's like the Wizard of Oz. We, we pull back the curtain and see mm. these mechanics by exactly as you describe. You, you go to work. You can't go to work in the same clothes. Um, I mean, it, it's bizarre. I, I used to, um, way back in, in, I think in those scritty days, I had really long dreadlocks then, and I used to have um, a friend of mine who I met at the club as a hairdresser. She said, oh, I'll tend your locks for you. We'll do it once a month. So I used to go and, uh, go to her place, and she'd do it at home. Or if she came to my place, then she would bring a change of clothes and an iron and all sorts of stuff if she is staying with me. And then I go, why do you need all that? She said, I can't turn up at work in the same clothes. Or they'll know I've been out all night. I go, well, what's wrong with you being out? I know it it's, looks bad to the boss. You know, we have to be on, you know, it's like almost on call. You know, you can't have any fun during the week. And um, all that just got blown away by the pandemic because you can just, uh, you know, just change the color filter, and it looks like you know your green shirt looks like a blue shirt. You know, just, mm. I'm I'm kidding, but there there was ways 
exactly as you say and everyone's in their pajamas and their slippers and so i wonder about women i know nothing about this but you know what's it like getting into kitten heels again and uh what what you're expected to wear it must be like being hobbled like in the chinese court you know <laughs> yeah look uh it's such an interesting thing i mean look um and, and i think the wizard of oz is a really great um analogy to bring up you know these things that we once thought was the almighty oz but really behind <laughs> the curtain is just this sweaty old dude that's in buttons you know um and that's what sort of, sort of we've, we're just dis, we're discovering for ourselves you know and like i think that yeah. the 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 general overall theme that i'm getting from this conversation and like you know just talking to you mate is that you know this this theme of diy and this like self-empowerment and re returning to you know one's own you know sense of you know uh self-sufficiency and the ability to be like you know, a craftsman to some degree, you know, to use our yeah. hands, to get our yeah. hands dirty, um, to do the work essentially, and, and, and do that on a daily basis and tend to our own needs without relying on all these external things like services and products and um, people and businesses, whatever it is, like it, they're all great. Like, um, don't get me wrong. I, I'm, I'm a consu consumer just as everyone else is to some yeah. degree. But we can choose as well as to like how we can, you know, I guess, um, utilize our own abilities and continue to sharpen these um, and to be uh, to some degree self-sufficient in, in a world that is largely um, looking outside uh, for, for, for assistance and help. And, and essentially, it's like reliance, really, right? It's really yeah. like built a sense of reliance to the outside world um, and yeah. in, in an in, inability for oneself to to really, uh, you know, uh, I guess, tend to or, or, or adapt to situations of, of uh, drastic change, just like, you know, COVID. Yeah, and, and what a wonderful business model for a consumer society to make you dependent, make us all dependent on uh, buying services, goods, subscriptions, uh, organizing a delivery system where we don't even have to think all coming from one massive warehouse. I mean, it's bizarre. If you wrote it in the science fiction story, people would go, yeah, people would never go for that. We've gone for it, you know, mm -hmm. gradually. And we're there. And and a pandemic has turned up to give us a chance to question it. My, I, I, I live with this daily kind of inner panic. It's almost a terror of just going back to how things were you know not learning the lesson from it you, you always get politicians when they want to get out of something they say yeah lessons were learned we have a chance now to learn every lesson we need to live a life that is less consumer and more in flow generated by ourselves and our own efforts which we've enjoyed in these pandemic times mm. um but there will be a force of uh, you know, anybody who's in business who's, who relied on that model to sell us stuff <coughs> will be trying to, you know, bring about a kind of global amnesia to, to what we've done. So we don't learn any lessons and we don't go, do you know what? I really enjoyed um, lifting those logs in the park. Uh, <laughs> there will, and it's probably started already, but that's um it's such it will be so sad if we just go back to that because the curtain's been pulled you know you can use any metaphors you want you know i think the the oz um example is good because yes the curtain's pulled back but the thing um and i, I recently had this with a client actually it's the first client who'd ever complained about an event that I'd done online where they thought it didn't deliver, but they weren't there. It was a, it was a CFO uh, who was looking after the invoice. Uh, everyone who came to the event was really happy, especially the booker. She said, the feedback's amazing. But the CFO looked at what I did, which was basically play music online and get people to dance to it in their own homes. And she said, um, we thought everyone was going to have drums. And we thought, you know, she had this kind of fantasy. It's like this Oz fantasy mm. you know how do i get drums in everybody's home and i explained even if i did 
we can't do a drum session because uh, everything's, you know, latency issues. So it's impossible. But I said to her, look, um, and I used the Wizard of Oz, uh, and she was convinced by this eventually. I used the Wizard of Oz um, metaphor. I said, yeah, there was just some levers and pulleys and stuff behind the curtain, and it was all, <coughs> you know, um, generated in a way that looked like it was magic, but it wasn't. Um, but look at what happened. You know, the lion got his courage, the, the tin man got his heart, and the straw man got a brain, but by doing the journey. And this is what I'm doing with them. I'm, I'm taking them on a journey where they, they don't even know they're on the journey. That I, like I'm saying, um, if I was at a physical conference and I'd said, okay, so we're coming to the section where we all wear hats. Did you get the email about bring a hat to the conference? They go, no, I didn't read that email. Uh, I couldn't get it on the plane. Well, I tried, but then my daughter wouldn't let me take it out. You know, there'd be all these things. But if I say to them, okay, you're all at home. Um, all right, so we're going to do this next bit with wooden spoons. Just get two things from the kitchen, right? And they come back. They might One might be a spatula. Or I say, if you haven't, if you can't move, so we're going to play this rhythm, right? That, 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 that. And we're going to, so it's kind of uh, simplified clave rhythm. I say, if you can't move, just get two things that are on the desk. Could be two remote controls. That, that, that. So I can do that. And they can't say, oh, I didn't get the email because everyone's got two things in the house that they can click together. If I say, all right, so next song, we're going to play Groove is in the Heart. So I want you to be a pop star. See, see if you've got a hat, you know. And then they might come along with a hat like this. And they go, all right, so see if you can get it on with your headphone. And then, and then they part, you, children join in at this point. They start putting three hats on their heads and uh, five pairs of sunglasses. <laughs> so I can, do, um, I can do stuff like that, which requires no gala dinner, no flying to... <laughs> no, no. We can do this all online. And do you know what the effects are? bigger than if, if they'd got the email we all went to a conference and it was said, all right it's the hat song so um in terms of the the wizard of oz the, the wizard of oz kind of uh promised this i'll do all this magic for you if you get to where i am whereas we're kind of creating the magic by building <clears throat> Well, we're getting the magic on the journey, actually, which is exactly what happened in, in The Wizard of Oz. That's how they yeah. all got their hearts, their courage, and their brains. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Do you know what? Um, I got your message. Are you ready for the podcast? I was lying in bed texting my mate about his studio. So <laughs> I said, that's why I said, can we do it in 15 minutes? So um, so excuse me if I'm, no, I'm still... No dramas. No dramas. It was... Uh, you know. <laughs> And thank you for joining us. You know, like, honestly, you know, I think if, if we leave our audience with anything from today's discussion, you know, that, that um, beautiful analogy and that mytho mythology behind um, the Wizard of Oz and, you know, uh, revealing behind the curtain and really looking at, at the rawness of what, you know, life truly is and what we can do about it, essentially, you know, to look within rather yeah. than looking outside of ourselves and praising this, this uh, you know, this all-powerful Oz. Um, it's a great place to, you know, reflect and uh, introspective moments for ourselves. So, yeah, if, if that is the only thing that we leave with the audience, that's a beautiful place for, for us mm -hmm. to sort of wrap up the conversation. So, well, thanks. yeah. So, again, thank you so much for joining us, Tom. Um, I'd love for you to share with our audience where they can find out a little bit more about what you do and where they can, you know, get in touch with you if they feel like uh, they, they'd like to do so. So, Sure. Well, I'm all over social media. Uh, it uh, but the best way, I suppose, is just to go to my website where all those things are listed on the contact page. And my name is Tom Morley, M-O-R-L-E-Y. And my website is tommorley.com. So it's all there. Otherwise, just look for me um, around whatever your favorite um, platform is, be it Instagram or Facebook or uh, LinkedIn especially. <coughs> I can't get on with Twitter. I, I, uh, I've kind of abandoned Twitter as a project, but I am there. 
at Tom Morley. I grabbed the name early, so. Uh, <laughs> Fair enough, mate. <laughs> no dramas. What we'll do is uh, we'll add all those links into the show notes so people can find you easily, mate. Oh, brilliant. Thanks. Yeah. And Sean, where can people find you, mate? Yep. Easiest place to find me is just on Instagram. It's Sean underscore Coop. So S-H-A-U-N underscore C-O-O-P. You can send me a message or connect with me there. And um, people can also find you and I, Les, at uh, true-north.co for some of the work we're doing there. If you're interested, jump on that website and um, you can get in touch with us. And how about you, Les? Where can they find you? Yep. You can find me on my website as well, findingspace.co. All my latest programs and things like this will be there. So you can shoot me a message through there. Otherwise on socials, it's uh, Instagram and Facebook as well. It's at findingspace.co. And Tom, I just want to take this opportunity as well to thank you for joining us today. It's been an incredibly enjoyable conversation. I love all the different paths that we wound down and um, yeah, I hope that uh, you continue to get people to get in sync and, you know, pull back that curtain and show them what it's really about. So uh-huh. until next time, guys, thanks Thank for joining you guys. us. Cheers. Thanks for that. Thanks for that. Here I am in my many forms. <laughs> <laughs>